Prelude of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Prelude. Who that cares much to know the history of man, and how the mysterious mixture behaves under the varying experiments of time, has not dwelt at least briefly on the life of St. Teresa, has not smiled with some gentleness at the thought of the little girl walking forth one morning hand in hand with her still smaller brother to go and seek martyrdom in the country of the Moors? Out they toddled from rugged Avila, wide-eyed and helpless-looking as two fawns, but with human hearts already beating to a national idea, until domestic reality met them in the shape of uncles and turned them back from their great resolve. That child pilgrimage was a fit beginning. Teresa's passionate, ideal nature demanded an epic life. What were many volumed romances of chivalry and the social conquests of a brilliant girl to her? Her flame quickly burned up in that light fuel and, fed from within, soared after some illimitable satisfaction, some object which would never justify weariness, which would reconcile self-despair with the rapturous consciousness of life beyond self. She found her epos in the reform of a religious order. That Spanish woman who lived three hundred years ago was certainly not the last of her kind. Many Teresas have been born who found for themselves no epic life wherein there was a constant unfolding of far resonant action. Perhaps only a life of mistakes, the offspring of a certain spiritual grandeur ill-matched with the meanness of opportunity. Perhaps a tragic failure which found no sacred poet and sank unwept into oblivion. With dim lights and tangled circumstance, they tried to shape their thought and deed in noble agreement, but after all, to common eyes, their struggles seemed mere inconsistency and formlessness, for these later-born Teresas were helped by no coherent social faith and order which could perform the function of knowledge for the ardently willing soul. Their ardor alternated between a vague ideal and the common yearning of womanhood so that the one was disapproved as extravagance, and the other condemned as a lapse. Some have felt that these blundering lives are due to the inconvenient indefiniteness with which the supreme power has fashioned the natures of women. If there were one level of feminine incompetence as strict as the ability to count three and no more, the social lot of women might be treated with scientific certitude. Meanwhile, the indefiniteness remains, and the limits of variation are really much wider than any one would imagine from the sameness of women's coiffure and the favorite love stories in prose and verse. Here and there a signet is reared uneasily among the ducklings in the brown pond, and never finds the living stream in fellowship with its own ori-footed kind. Here and there is born a St. Teresa, foundress of nothing, whose loving heart beats and sobs after an unattained goodness tremble off and are dispersed among hindrances, instead of centering in some long recognizable deed. Book One Miss Brook Chapter One Since I can do no good because a woman, reach constantly at something that is near it. The Maid's Tragedy Beaumont and Fletcher. Miss Brooke had that kind of beauty which seems to be thrown into relief by poor dress. Her hand and wrist were so finely formed that she could wear sleeves not less bare of style than those in which the Blessed Virgin appeared to Italian painters. And her profile, as well as her stature and bearing, seemed to gain the more dignity from her plain garments which, by the side of provincial fashion, gave her the impressiveness of a fine quotation from the Bible, or from one of our elder poets in a paragraph of today's newspaper. 
She was usually spoken of as being remarkably clever, but with the addition that her sister Celia had more common sense. Nevertheless, Celia wore scarcely more trimmings, and it was only to close observers that her dress differed from her sister's, and had a shade of coquetry in its arrangements, for Miss Brooke's plain dressing was due to mixed conditions, in most of which her sister shared. The pride of being ladies had something to do with it. The Brooke connections, though not exactly aristocratic, were unquestionably good. If you inquired backward for a generation or two, you would not find any yard-measuring or parcel-tying forefathers, anything lower than an admiral or a clergyman, and there was even an ancestor discernible as a Puritan gentleman who served under Cromwell, but afterwards conformed, and managed to come out of all political troubles as the proprietor of a respectable family estate. Young women of such birth, living in a quiet country house, and attending a village church hardly larger than a parlor, naturally regarded frippery as the ambition of a huckster's daughter. Then there was well-bred economy, which in those days made show in dress the first item to be deducted from, when any margin was required for expenses more distinctive of rank. Such reasons would have been enough to account for plain dress, quite apart from religious feeling but in Miss Brooke's case religion alone would have determined it, and Celia mildly acquiesced in all her sister's sentiments, only infusing them with that common sense which is able to accept momentous doctrines without any eccentric agitation. Dorothea knew many passages of Pascal's Pensées and of Jeremy Taylor by heart, and to her the destinies of mankind, seen by the light of Christianity, made the solicitudes of feminine fashion appear an occupation for bedlam. She could not reconcile the anxieties of a spiritual life involving eternal consequences with a keen interest in gimp and artificial protrusions of drapery. Her mind was theoretic, and yearned by its nature after some lofty conception of the world which might frankly include the parish of Tipton and her own rule of conduct there. She was enamored of intensity and greatness, and rash in embracing whatever seemed to her to have those aspects, likely to seek martyrdom, to make retractations, and then to incur martyrdom after all in a quarter where she had not sought it. Certainly such elements in the character of a marriageable girl tended to interfere with her lot, and hinder it from being decided according to custom, by good looks, vanity, and merely canine affection. With all this, she, the elder of the sisters, was not yet twenty, and they had both been educated, since they were about twelve years old and had lost their parents, on plans at once narrow and promiscuous, first in an English family, and afterwards in a Swiss family at Lausanne, their bachelor uncle and guardian, trying in this way to remedy the disadvantages of their orphaned condition. It was hardly a year since they had come to live at Tipton Grange with their uncle, a man nearly sixty, of acquiescent temper, miscellaneous opinions, and uncertain vote. He had travelled in his younger years, and was held in this part of the country to have contracted a too rambling habit of mind. Mr. Brooke's conclusions were as difficult to predict as the weather. It was only safe to say that he would act with benevolent intentions, that he would spend as little money as possible in carrying them out. For the most glutinously indefinite minds enclose some hard grains of habit, and a man has been seen lax about all his own interests except the retention of his snuff-box, concerning which he was watchful, suspicious, and greedy of clutch. In Mr. Brooke, the hereditary strain of Puritan energy was clearly in abeyance, but in his niece Dorothea it glowed alike through faults and virtues, turning sometimes into impatience of her uncle's talk, or his way of letting things be on his estate, and making her long all the more for the time when she would be of age 
and have some command of money for generous schemes. She was regarded as an heiress, for not only had the sisters seven hundred a year each from their parents, but if Dorothea married and had a son, that son would inherit Mr. Brooke's estate, presumably worth about three thousand a year, a rental which seemed wealth to provincial families, still discussing Mr. Peel's late conduct on the Catholic question, innocent of future goldfields, and of that gorgeous plutocracy which has so nobly exalted the necessities of genteel life. And how should Dorothea not marry? A girl so handsome and with such prospects? Nothing could hinder it but her love of extremes, and her insistence on regulating life according to notions which might cause a wary man to hesitate before he made her an offer, or might even lead her at last to refuse all offers. A young lady of some birth and fortune, who knelt suddenly down on a brick floor by the side of a sick laborer, and prayed fervidly as if she thought herself living in the time of the apostles, who had strange whims of fasting like a papist, and of sitting up at night to read old theological books, such a wife might awaken you some fine morning with a new scheme for the application of her income, which would interfere with political economy and the keeping of saddle-horses. A man would naturally think twice before he risked himself in such fellowship. Women were expected to have weak opinions, but the great safeguard of society and of domestic life was that opinions were not acted on. Sane people did what their neighbors did, so that if any lunatics were at large, one might know and avoid them. The rural opinion about the new young ladies, even among the cottagers, was generally in favor of Celia, as being so amiable and innocent-looking, while Miss Brooke's large eyes seemed, like her religion, too unusual and striking. Poor Dorothea! Compared with her, the innocent-looking Celia was knowing and worldly-wise, so much subtler is a human mind than the outside tissues which make a sort of blazonry or clock-face for it. Yet those who approached Dorothea, though prejudiced against her by this alarming hearsay, found that she had a charm unaccountably reconcilable with it. Most men thought her bewitching when she was on horseback. She loved the fresh air and the various aspects of the country, and when her eyes and cheeks glowed with mingled pleasure, she looked very little like a devotee. Riding was an indulgence which she allowed herself in spite of conscientious qualms. She felt that she enjoyed it in a pagan, sensuous way, and always looked forward to renouncing it. She was open, ardent, and not in the least self-admiring. Indeed, it was pretty to see how her imagination adorned her sister Celia with attractions altogether superior to her own, and if any gentleman appeared to come to the Grange from some other motive than that of seeing Mr. Brooke, she concluded that he must be in love with Celia. Sir James Chetham, for example, whom she constantly considered from Celia's point of view, inwardly debating whether it would be good for Celia to accept him. That he should be regarded as a suitor to herself would have seemed to her a ridiculous irrelevance. Dorothea, with all her eagerness to know the truths of life, retained very childlike ideas about marriage. She felt sure that she would have accepted the judicious hooker if she had been born in time to save him from that wretched mistake he had made in matrimony, or John Milton when his blindness had come on, or any of the other great men whose odd habits it would have been glorious piety to endure. But an amiable, handsome baronet, who said exactly to her remarks, even when she expressed uncertainty, how could he affect her as a lover? The really delightful marriage must be that where your husband was a sort of father, and could teach you even Hebrew if you wished it. These peculiarities of Dorothea's character caused Mr. Brooke to be all the more blamed in neighboring families for not securing some middle-aged lady as a guide and companion to his nieces. But he himself dreaded so much the sort of superior woman likely to be available for such position that he allowed himself to be dissuaded by Dorothea's objections, 
and was in this case brave enough to defy the world that is to say mrs cadwallader the rector's wife and the small group of gentry with whom he visited in the northeast corner of loamshire so miss brooke presided in her uncle's household and did not at all dislike her new authority with the homage that belonged to it sir james chettam was going to dine at the grange to-day with another gentleman whom the girls had never seen and about whom dorothea felt some venerating expectation this was the rev edward casaubon noted in the county as a man of profound learning understood for many years to be engaged on a great work concerning religious history also as a man of wealth enough to give lustre to his piety and having views of his own which were to be more clearly ascertained on the publication of his book his very name carried an impressiveness hardly to be measured without a precise chronology of scholarship early in the day dorothea had returned from the infant school which she had set going in the village and was taking her usual place in the pretty sitting-room which divided the bedrooms of the sisters bent on finishing a plan for some buildings a kind of work which she delighted in when celia who had been watching her with a hesitating desire to propose something said dorothea dear if you don't mind if you are not very busy suppose we looked at mamma's jewels to-day and divided them it is exactly six months to-day since uncle gave them to you and you haven't looked at them yet celia's face had the shadow of a pouting expression in it the full presence of the pout being kept back by a habitual awe of dorothea and principle two associated facts which might show a mysterious electricity if you touched them incautiously to her relief dorothea's eyes were full of laughter as she looked up what a wonderful little almanac you are celia is it six calendar or six lunar months it is the last day of september now and it was the first of april when uncle gave them to you you know he said that he had forgotten them till then i believe you have never thought of them since you locked them up in the cabinet here well dear we should never wear them you know dorothea spoke in a full cordial tone half caressing half explanatory she had her pencil in her hand and was making tiny side plans on a margin celia colored and looked very grave i think dear we are wanting in respect to mamma's memory to put them by and take no notice of them and she added after hesitating little with a rising sob of mortification necklaces are quite usual now and madame poinçon who was stricter in some things even than you are used to wear ornaments and christians generally surely there are women in heaven now who wore jewels celia was conscious of some mental strength when she really applied herself to argument you would like to wear them exclaimed dorothea an air of astonished discovery animating her whole person with a dramatic action which she had caught from that very madame poinçon who wore the ornaments of course then let us have them out why did you not tell me before but the keys the keys she pressed her hands against the side of her head and seemed to despair of her memory they are here said celia with whom this explanation had been long meditated and prearranged pray open the large drawer of the cabinet and get out the jewel-box the casket was soon open before them and the various jewels spread out making a bright parterre on the table it was no great collection but a few of the ornaments were really of remarkable beauty the finest that was obvious at first being a necklace of purple amethysts set in exquisite gold work and a pearl cross with five brilliants in it dorothea immediately took up the necklace and fastened it round her sister's neck where it fitted almost as closely as a bracelet but the circle suited the henrietta maria style of celia's head and neck and she could see that it did in the pier-glass opposite there celia you can wear that with your indian muslin but this cross you must wear with your dark dresses celia was trying not to smile with pleasure oh dodo you must keep the cross yourself no no dear no said dorothea putting up her hand with careless deprecation 
"'Yes, indeed, you must. It would suit you. In your black dress, now,' said Celia, insistingly. "'You might wear that.' "'Not for the world. Not for the world. A cross is the last thing I would wear as a trinket,' Dorothea shuddered lightly. "'Then you will think it wicked in me to wear it,' said Celia, uneasily. "'No, dear, no,' said Dorothea, stroking her sister's cheek. "'Souls have complexions, too. What will suit one will not suit another.' "'But you might like to keep it for mamma's sake.' "'No, I have other things of mamma's. Her sandalwood box, which I am so fond of. Plenty of things. In fact, they are all yours, dear. We need discuss them no longer. There, take away your property.' Celia felt a little hurt. There was a strong assumption of superiority in this puritanic toleration, hardly less trying to the blonde flesh of an unenthusiastic sister than a puritanic persecution. "'But how can I wear ornaments if you, who are the elder sister, will never wear them?' "'Nay, Celia, that is too much to ask, that I should wear trinkets to keep you in countenance. If I were to put on such a necklace as that, I should feel as if I had been pirouetting. The whole world would go round with me, and I should not know how to walk. Celia had unclasped the necklace and drawn it off. It would be a little tight for your neck. Something to lie down and hang would suit you better, she said, with some satisfaction. The complete unfitness of the necklace from all points of view for Dorothea made Celia happier in taking it. She was opening some ring-boxes, which disclosed a fine emerald with diamonds, and just then the sun passing beyond a cloud sent a bright gleam over the table. "'How very beautiful these gems are,' said Dorothea, under a new current of feeling, as sudden as the gleam. "'It is strange how deeply colors seem to penetrate one, like scent. I suppose that is the reason why gems are used as spiritual emblems in the Revelation of St. John.' They look like fragments of heaven. I think that emerald is more beautiful than any of them. "'And there's a bracelet to match it,' said Celia. "'We did not notice this at first. "'They are lovely,' said Dorothea, slipping the ring and bracelet on her finely turned finger and wrist, and holding them towards the window on a level with her eyes. All the while her thought was trying to justify her delight in the colors by merging them in her mystic religious joy. "'You would like those, Dorothea,' said Celia, rather falteringly, beginning to think with wonder that her sister showed some weakness, and also that emeralds would suit her own complexion even better than purple amethysts. "'You must keep that ring and bracelet, if nothing else. But see, these agates are very pretty and quiet.' "'Yes, I will keep these, this ring and bracelet,' said Dorothea. Then, letting her hand fall on the table, she said in another tone, "'Yet what miserable men find such things, and work at them, and sell them!' She paused again, and Celia thought that her sister was going to renounce the ornaments, as in consistency she ought to do. "'Yes, dear, I will keep these,' said Dorothea decidedly but take all the rest away, and the casket. She took up her pencil without removing the jewels, and still looking at them. She thought of often having them by her, to feed her eye at these little fountains of pure color. "'Shall you wear them in company?' said Celia, who was watching her with real curiosity as to what she would do. Dorothea glanced quickly at her sister. Across all her imaginative adornment of those whom she loved, there darted now and then a keen discernment, which was not without a scorching quality. If Miss Brooke ever attained perfect meekness, it would not be for lack of inward fire. Perhaps, she said rather haughtily, I cannot tell to what level I may sink. Celia blushed and was unhappy. She saw that she had offended her sister, and dared not say even anything pretty about the gift of the ornaments which she had put back into the box and carried away. Dorothea, too, was unhappy, as she went on with her plan drawing, questioning the purity of her own feeling and speech in the scene which had ended with that little explosion. 
Celia's consciousness told her that she had not been at all in the wrong. It was quite natural and justifiable that she should have asked that question. And she repeated to herself that Dorothea was inconsistent. Either she should have taken her full share of the jewels, or, after what she had said, she should have renounced them altogether. "'I am sure, at least I trust,' thought Celia, "'that the wearing of a necklace will not interfere with my prayers. "'And I do not see that I should be bound by Dorothea's opinions "'now that we are going into society, "'though of course she herself ought to be bound by them. "'But Dorothea is not always consistent.' "'Thus Celia, mutely bending over her tapestry, "'until she heard her sister calling her. "'Here, Kitty, come and look at my plan.' I shall think I am a great architect if I have not got incompatible stairs and fireplaces. As Celia bent over the paper, Dorothea put her cheek against her sister's arm caressingly. Celia understood the action. Dorothea saw that she had been in the wrong, and Celia pardoned her. Since they could remember, there had been a mixture of criticism and awe in the attitude of Celia's mind towards her elder sister. The younger had always worn a yoke, but is there any yoked creature without its private opinions? End of chapter 1